Welcome to Dream Loudly, an I'm Possible original show sponsored by the Dream Loudly Foundation. The Dream Loudly Foundation will be involved in giving scholarships for players, for trainers, for coaches, and a lot more to come. And welcome to our first episode of the Dream Loudly podcast. Now, on this first episode, we're going to be discussing a number of things, but we're going to start off with what we're going to do a lot on this show, which is we're going to play an audio, and we're going to respond to that audio and talk about that topic. So I'm going to go ahead and get that started. Hey man, I'm telling you, purposeful training. I just got done with a kid who I've been training for about a year. He goes back home and trains with other guys. And I'm not saying the med balls and rip cones and all that. Yes, that helps skill. That helps explosiveness. But he has that now. But he has that now. That's, that's my struggle with it. I think it goes to show how little they pay attention to what we actually talk about and what we actually preach because you just agreed with exactly what we do for players. We make them more skilled. Yeah, it almost seemed like that the intent, and, and I'm not going to judge you know, the intent all, all the way, but I think a lot of times stuff like this, it's like they're coming at us, Yeah, but they're not. It's what we always say. Yeah, it's, you it's, know, it's spot on. It, number one, he's 100% agreeing with, with our methods right here of what yep. we would say. Yep. He talked about rip cones and the med balls helping, mm-hmm. being effective, helping with both skills and explosiveness, yep. which is what we talk about. So there is 100% not an issue here. Yep. The fact that people think there's an issue with this is, I think, what we need to talk about. Well, I, well, I think it, it's, it, it always comes back to what we talk about. Everybody feels like they have to choose a side. There's got to be a right way and there's got to be a wrong way. But I, I've always thought about it this way, too. Like if I, if I was a coach completely outside this realm, my player is working with trainers. Would I rather be receiving a player that is extremely high in skill that I can kind of mold and teach and turn them into a basketball player? Or would I want a player that's high in IQ and, and understands the game but has no ability whatsoever? Like they just can't do anything. They understand basketball, but they can't dribble, they can't shoot, they don't have ball handling ability, they don't know how to move. You still don't have anything. Right, and that's why like my first impression when I first heard this is thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Exactly. You know, you're right, I agree mm-hmm. with you. The rip cones, the medicine balls, and how we use it helps with skill. Yep. Let's stop right there for a second and just understand that that's the whole purpose. Yeah. We don't have to talk about the rest of the stuff quite Mm -hmm. yet because the whole purpose of skill enhancement and what we do is 100% help with skill. Yeah. So with that being said, let's listen to the second part of the audio. So if players have the skill somewhat and the explosiveness somewhat, make sure they are working on game-like moves. Shots off the dribble they are going to get in the game. Give them solutions, not weaving in and out of cones as much as coming off a down screen or a pin and guarding. Have them read a defender, but moves they will make in a game. Those are your moves in practice. And I, and I think this, again, we agree with this. Like, like you're, you're not wrong. We always talk about players graduating what we do. You yep. get to a point, you're skilled, you have the handle, you have the footwork, you should move on to somebody else. We, we've done it with NBA players, we've done it with local players, trainers, we've done it with flying players. Like, hey, you're very skilled. Now we need to find you a guy who can maybe run you through some more game situation style training. Yeah, and we've always talked about it, it's nothing different. We're skill enhancement. Mm-hmm. We do not preach against game situations. No, not at all. We just don't do them in that same extent. Are we capable of it? Yeah, but that's not what people are coming to us for. Yeah. And so people come to us for the skill enhancement piece. And so once again, no disagreements whatsoever. No, not at all. When you reach a certain point of skill, and I'm going to ignore for right now that he said the word somewhat. Yeah. Okay, so let's just go ahead and, and talk on if someone reaches peak skill. Yep. Which in our case, since we're specialists in it, I think a lot of times we have the advantage of being able to really know if someone's skilled. Yeah, know what it looks like. We're some of the few that are able to take NBA players and show them their weaknesses, which is what we do for them. But let's say we're talking about a guy like Kyrie, Mm -hmm. a guy like Carl Anthony Towns. When you reach that level of skill, we're the first ones to say, you don't need us. Yeah. At that point... You don't need us to be the skill specialist. It, like the way I've said it in the past is Steph Curry no longer needs a shooting coach. No. <laughs> and it's not that that is not a insult to the best shooting coaches in the world. Not at all. He just doesn't need it. Mm. So skill is like that too. Yep. But the somewhat word is where I'm saying, yeah, there's levels to skill that we still got to talk about. For sure. No, and, and, and 
we, we've talked about this in the past with like, okay, you know, Carl Towns started with us in about eighth grade. Carl Towns' dad's goal was, was the whole time, if you have a player who's seven foot tall and you give them skill and ability, their percentage chance of making it to the next level is already really high. They've got, they've got that height. Most people just don't have that. But then when you start to look at, you know, let's look at normal players, players that are around six foot, six foot one. They've got to have something more. They've got to have something special about them. And that's usually what the skill is. Like, what is their actual ability? And we, we see this with young players all the time. You know, we have players who grow up through what we do. You know, they've worked on all the skills. They, they, they've really gone through the checklist system. And then eventually, they move on. They work with other people. And I think the problem that most people have, it's the ego of wanting to own players and thinking that they should only train with you. Right. We, want, we want them to graduate. It means we've done our job at that point, and now it's off to somebody else to teach them maybe something we didn't teach, maybe to give them a different perspective. And I think sometimes it comes from the, the standpoint where trainers want to feel like they're wearing every hat. Yeah. But even like talking about this audio right here, they're not wearing every hat. No. He's talking about them being already skilled so he can do his job. Yeah. And so that's okay. And it's perfect. <laughs> that's exactly how, yeah. how it should be. It's very, very difficult for, to wear every hat. Yeah. Um, not necessarily in terms of just the ability to execute it, but just the ability to focus on a player and really know what they need and what you can do best for them. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I, I, can, I feel comfortable doing game situations. Yep. I can rebound like the best of them. <laughs> I'm not saying that they're <laughs> rebounders, but I'm just saying a lot of situational training ends up being getting your reads, getting your spots, yeah. and I just, that's not what, where I'm gonna give my best to a player. Yep. There's levels to that, of course, but for the most part, what people are coming to me for are not getting them their reps, not getting them their reads, not teaching them about basketball. I'm teaching them about their bodies, about yeah. their footwork, about themselves, and that's what role we play. And so coaches and trainers don't have to wear every single hat. Definitely. And that message completely supports that. Yeah. And so if you're a player, we always just say it this way, find people who can help you on your skills mm -hmm. and find people who can help you with your IQ. Find people who can help you with your game situations. And if you can find those recipes, you're in good hands. But make sure you're getting everything somehow. Yeah. And, and I, when you look at both sides of it, like, like game enhancement, you know, there, there's obviously a lot of videos surfacing around right now about with, with the NBA players playing against, you know, kind of live action five on five where they have kind of sticks and poles in their hands to make it a little bit easier for them to try to guard players that are that good. And it looks awesome. You know, you see Kyrie's in these videos, he's going around, probably barely gets blocked. But that's somebody who's highly skilled already. You take a player who has no ability or very little ability and you put them in that, they're not going to really get better at all because they don't have the ability to get around these players, to make changes of direction, to do this. And that's why, again, both sides are so good. Like if I could take some of my players who are really skilled, drop them into that, that training is going to do a lot for them. It's going to help them try to figure out how, to, how they like to utilize their skills, how they like to do stuff. It's, it's like live game simulation. It's never going to be quite the same, but it's, it's part of it. Yeah, and, and, and that's where it's so important to talk about that word again, somewhat. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what was the exact somewhat what? Somewhat skilled? Yeah, somewhat. If your more skills are, are somewhat like, there. Yeah. And I think that's one of the issues. If you don't specialize in skill enhancement right. and you're more on the game situational side, a lot of times... You, you just don't notice that they're not actually yeah. all the way skilled. So, you know, when we're talking about people who aren't the Kyries and Carl Anthony Towns of the world, mm -hmm. they're not dominant. They're not dominating their age group. They're not dominant at their level. You know, sometimes people think they're skilled, but they're really not. Yeah, there's... there's... It's, not, it's not real game-ready skill. Yeah. And so what we, what we do and what we're the best at is being able to take a player that someone thinks is skilled and show yeah. them why they're not. Yeah, because Do they actually have it. Yeah, is it surface level skill? Is it faking a coach skill? Yeah. Is it, you know, I can do this drill and you think it's skilled, but it's not going to work in the game. Mm -hmm. And so, so often a, a, a player or, or, or say a coach will send me a player, send us a player. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, this player is really skilled. And then we get him and we're like, no, he's not. Yeah. 
You know, he looks good in a zigzag, but do you notice his body positioning here? Do you notice his footwork here? Do you notice how his shoulder positioning is off? Well, he even talked about it in the video, and it might have been in that first clip or second clip where he was talking about, you know, that angle cone drill. Every coach does it. Coaches have probably about five to ten drills on what they think, you know, this, this player can get through these drills. This makes them skilled. Where really that many drills is really covering just surface area of how many skills there are. Um, but... That's where, that's where, again, and we've seen it through other social media posts of people, you know, kind of hating on that drill, which it has nothing to do with the drill itself. It's just, yeah, players yeah. have to graduate from that. Like, we're always talking about that. Once you can do a drill and you can really kill it, you can get through it, you don't really need to do it anymore. You know, Steph Curry's pregame warm-up is obviously notorious. He goes through the same two-ball drills. He goes through some basically ladder drills of three crosses pass, four crosses pass, four throughs pass. Like, he's just building one. He doesn't really need to do those drills anymore. He's already sufficient at them. He's already good at them. He does them because he likes the drills. He does them because it gets him warmed up. He likes the way it gets his kind of motor going. But for the most part, that's one of the things that players are also struggling with is just graduating to the next drill. Like, right. just be able to move on, move forward, work on the next skill, where a lot of that comes from the basis of everybody thinks you need to work on the same thing over and over and over. But I think that graduation portion on drills, that graduation portion on trainers, I think trainers need to be not so sensitive on a player can move away from this drill, move forward. They can also move away from you at some point, which is perfectly fine. Yeah, and the, the whole purpose of this podcast is dreams. Yeah. Right? So dreams is always going to be the theme here. We're talking about the dreams of players, the dreams of coaches, the, dream, the dreams of trainers. Yeah. And we're always going to talk about messages that we feel, whether or not directly or indirectly, can negatively impact dreams. Absolutely. And this, to me, falls in the line, not by the intent, but if you notice, like, there was an aggressiveness to the message. For sure. And there, it's almost as if... We're basically trying to create a separation mm -hmm. between them, and we're trying to always create that yeah. inclusion. You trying need to create both. that unity, yeah. which there should be. And, and so here's the danger of the message. Okay, So the problem is if you bash skills to the point mm -hmm. where you barely need them, only somewhat need to be skilled, yeah. and then you skip all over that and just tell everyone to do game reads, game situations, so many players are going to be hurt by that. Yeah. And it also encourages coaches and trainers not to learn about skill. Mm -hmm. You know, it's skipped and over. It's not really a big deal. And I think one of the poisons of the basketball culture is that so often it, skills are kind of left whether or not you get it naturally or not. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you put everyone in a drill. The good ones do it naturally. The bad ones don't. You don't yeah. know how to correct it. The bad ones get benched. The good ones play. Mm -hmm. And that's the way basketball works. There is a way to help the players at the end of the bench mm -hmm. become more skilled and even pass players in rotation. Yeah if you know what you're doing with skill. Absolutely. And so it makes no sense to degrade skill because skill does not replace what they're talking about. Nope. You need to work on both of them together. Mm -hmm. um, now, before we go any further, let's just go ahead and, and just address this, okay? So this is a well-known trainer. Yep. We're not going at him. Nope. If you recognize the voice, that wasn't our intent. I mean, we've agreed with the yeah, majority of what he says. It's, we're exact, not, it's what we preach. We're not having beef here. No. The whole purpose when we're talking about audios like this is so we can talk about topics and then people have context of what we're saying, what Absolutely. we're talking about. So no ill will, nothing no. against what they're saying at all. But I think that the message can be dangerous if people don't understand yeah. that this is 100% supporting what we're talking about, but there's no there's no aggressiveness towards the other side. No. And so that's what I want to be able to, to make sure that trainers, players, and coaches understand. You need both. Yep. You need skill. You need game. And if a player is, is not effective in the game and you think they're skilled, it doesn't mean that the skills aren't working. Yeah. It first mean, might mean they're not actually as skilled as you think. And if that's the case, then that's where we come in. We might yep. have to come in and, and, and put some on that. And then, of course, it also can mean that they just haven't learned how to apply it yet, yep. which is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so, but you just have to give them uh, both sides of it so they can actually have the ability to reach that level. Yep. Now, what's interesting is this person in this clip is not going directly at us at all. Yeah. Because we're also people who are training those who travel in. Yeah. So in his example, a player travels to him for a couple days, and then he sends him. Then obviously he goes home and he trains with other guys. Yep. Right. And so wherever those other guys are, whether or not skill enhancement or game situational training, that's what he's talking about. We're the same type. So I don't train locals anymore. Players who are here, 
year round, I'm playing, I'm training people twice a year. They come yep. in for a week, two weeks, I give them skill, and then I send them back to other guys. And when they get back to those other guys, I'm hoping that they can find game situational training, mm -hmm. just like he's talked about, get their reads, get their experience, mm -hmm. and then hopefully they even can find someone skill-wise in yeah. their area. Otherwise, yep. I want them to repeat what I did with them for yeah. skills. That's the role. And what I love about it is he's talking about a community. Yeah. You know, you send them yeah. back, they work with other people. Yeah, we've always talked about that. Like, like even when we've talked with NBA guys and given them concept, like you should have your dietary person. You should have your person that's working on your body. You should have, you know, that, that's where like, even as a young player, okay, you might not have that deep of resources, but like that community of people that you go to train with multiple people. I think I, think I still talk to too many trainers who are way too sensitive on, oh, well, they train with me and they train with this guy, this guy, and this guy. Well, if I'm just handling skill, though, but they go to another guy that does a little bit more of, you know, they guard you off screens, they do this stuff, perfectly fine with that. That's just, that's just helping me more, you know, see that my players are maybe starting to utilize that skill a little bit more and it's starting to click a little bit. So it's, it's always a nice combination. Yeah, and I think I just want to give some understanding on this, too, of why we don't wear all the hats. And I think it really comes down to finances also. Yeah. If you're going to come and train with, with us, it's, it's going to be to the price of our specialty. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm not going to charge someone my price to do something that's relatively common and yeah. easy to find. For sure. You don't need to come to me and pay me for my services mm -hmm. for me to rebound for you while you do spot shots. Yeah. And so there, that's when you can easily get shots on your own. You can work with your coaches. You can work with your staff. And so some things you just don't need to pay for. No, not at all. And, and so when you're coming to me specifically, coming to you specifically, we're going to give you what we're specialized mm -hmm. in. We're going to be really honed in on what you're actually coming for because you don't need us to give you common bread and common water. Yeah. And so that's the other part of this too. Mm -hmm. In your area, you might have people who are a little bit more on the, the high end, the high ticket trainers, yeah. the ones who are in demand for their specialties that you can take little bits and pieces for. And then you have other people in your area who are going to be more of the everyday guys yeah. that you're training with Absolutely. three to four times a week. They're charging $20, $25 an hour. And, and you can get your reps with them, and that's not battling. That's things that are going to be happening, hopefully, in every area mm -hmm. that you can find experts and people who are just there to help. Well, I think, I think this is the difference. I, I still feel like we're probably one of the few trainers out there that actually do this. Is 99% of what we do is meant for you to be able to do on your own. I think what this trainer is talking about a lot is like you have a player in the gym with you continuously. Like they're there right. with you a lot. If, if I'm flying in to see you and the drills you're doing with me, I need you to guard me. I need you to do this with me. I can't take that home with me. I can't go home and work on that. I don't have that ability to have somebody in my driveway guarding me. Versus what we do, it's meant to send players home, go through the checklist app, do it more. When you need to come back to us, come back to us. You don't really need me for that when you go home. And that's how we train local players too. Yeah. We train them two to three times a month. Yep. So they can work on their individual skills on their own. They still have time to find a game situational trainer mm -hmm. if they need it or work with their coaching staff yeah, if they need it. A lot of it. them work with their coaches. Our training is designed to go parallel yep. with players training with other people and give them the tools to train on their own. Yeah. That's a community that's actually proven to build players. Yeah, which, which works awesome. And I think it keeps the excitement alive too is like – you know, I go to this guy, his style is kind of this, I go to this guy. Versus sometimes, like, like, I think you can have that little bit if you work with one person too much. Like, I think it's just natural habit a little bit is like, it just feels like the grind. Like, it just like, it's just day after day, you're kind of going through the same things. Versus being able to really switch it up on a daily basis. Like, it keeps the game fun, it keeps training fun. Um, you're more excited to kind of get in the gym. It's it's a really nice way to keep switching up your daily routine on, on what you're working on, what you're doing. Versus feeling like you're entering the gym just to do the same thing over and over. Just, you know, that's why everybody's always called, you know, shooting boring because they just do the same thing over and over versus being able to really switch up how you train something is just, I think it just makes training altogether just more fun. Yeah. And, and once again, it always comes back down to this, mm -hmm. the dream. And so in order, my message to trainers on this would simply be, let's just stay in unity and understand each other. Mm -hmm. And understand all the roles that we all play, the skill enhancement trainers, the game situational trainers, the yep. coaches, everyone plays a role. We're not fighting 
against each other yeah. until we tell someone, don't do that, just do this. Yeah. And so our role is always going to be support the dream, which means yep. we're going to be supporting all trainers and all roles Absolutely. in that message. Yep.